Thank you, Chris Genick, for the invitation. Thank you to Wendy Heldman for so expertly organizing the event. My name is Bruna Mori, and I teach writing classes here uh, at SciArc and also at Art Center. And Dereve is my new book. It's a compilation of cityscape poems and paintings based partially on writing to the ends of New York subway lines and generating a story at each. Uh, painter Matthew Kinney, I actually met on the street. And my designer, Peter Matthews, was actually a former SciArc student. I was going to try to speak a little bit about the idea of synecdoche and ascendantin in peripatetic literature. Um, however, I only have 10 minutes. So I thought I might focus a bit on the idea of the derive, which my book is based very loosely on. As many of you know, derive or drift, um, it's a situationist notion of following the ebbs and flows of the city, um, allowing yourself to follow these patterns on a non-capitalized time, if that's even possible in 2007. Basically without a particular destination and also not being beholden to the grids that have been created for us. I often assign this to my students in my writing classes and um, it's, it's a way to get us all up from behind our computers and out to what was formerly known as the real world. Um, in LA, it's always already a difficult proposition because writing itself is regarded as somewhat suspect. When my students do this, they're often questioned by uh, the police and also other pedestrians about what they're doing in their neighborhood. So it becomes as much about this notion of a shifting subjectivity as much as, as, as a rewriting or a reimagining of the cityscape. Philip Lopate wrote an essay which he believes that exploring the city itself is somewhat colonizing. He says, there is about this walking, usually in the case of men, an imperialistic vanity as though you could possess a city by marking it with your shoe leather, side by side with conviction of incurable solitude. I was not looking to find romance itself so much as to be invaded by a sharp glimpse of heart-stopping beauty. I never succeeded in rooting out the utopian dream of finding my soulmate or at least a fleeting paradigm in the street. So here are a couple of folks I encountered. Second Avenue, Manhattan. A man on the corner is smoking, the man smoking on the corner at the newsstand. The man at the corner newsstand is smoking at night, smoking at the newsstand. Is the man on the corner with a fedora on a corner smoking in New York? Is the man on the corner in the cold see his breath in the cold fedora? On a newsstand corner fedora breath on a night in New York corner newsstand? With breath of the newsstand breath cigarette fedora warming the night? With the newsstand smoke of breath and cigarette illuminated in lamplight of newsstand and the moon fedora and lamplight smoking cigarette and breath warming? Van Cortlandt Park, the Bronx. You say you need to know what you're looking for, knocking the eight ball in in no time. You were a cop. You were wearing a veteran of the Korean War cap. Yet we were talking about bluefish in your R&R in Japan. You were probably there around the time I was born. My father was doing a little R&R &R there, too. Uncle Sam sometimes defecates in the East River where you fish. He panhandles in front of a no-name pizza parlor, chews his gums, he shakes his can of change to the rhythm of trains, sits alongside our aging superheroes. The fishermen missing fingers are not gangsters. They wrangle with bluefish that breed in the undersea remains of Lower East Side tenements of tuberculosis and communism, buildings raised then dumped in the water. Feeders are the color of blood, you point to a Budweiser label, eating remnants of bunkers torn up by the blue. Sometimes there's a blowfish, the oriental delicacy of the sea, just rip the poison barb from the back of its neck. Upstate, you hunt from trees with a bow and arrow, use chicken gizzard as a lure, aiming for the heart of each animal above each right leg. Bears approach as unexpectedly as deer. By the time they spot you, your arrow is gone. When it hits, you grin. They scream like women. The smallest boy with a beaming smile watches how far his mother can spit into the sewer of rail, 
Her wide hips prevent him from rushing to the ledge. In Marco's poem, Helen Keller's Spick, Helen has less luck. She speaks little English, so when someone yells, stop, she keeps walking in his hip by an oncoming car. But I'm not killing Helen off. You remember telling her to learn English she was trying to understand. You were gesticulating with your hands in 1.5 languages, but she is blind, not deaf. She's now working at McDonald's, and they are up in arms. She gave you a fucking fajita. Oh, man. For she grabbed the double cheese, and I told her you didn't want no double cheese, but I didn't think she'd give you the fucking fajita. Happy Independence Day, USA. We will keep coming to these shores, welcomed by cows grilled on charcoals, masked by the remix of Blondie's Rapture, maybe to Van Cortlandt's Park, where there's slippery mustard on this fence. Michel de Certeau writes about the imagined versus the disappearing city. He writes, bodies follow the thicks and thins of an urban text they write without being able to read it. Their knowledge of them is as blind as that of lovers in each other's arms. To walk itself is described as lacking a place. It is the indefinite process of being absent and in search of a proper, a universe of rented spaces haunted by a nowhere or by dreamed of places. In response, I'd like to read another place. Today, I'm visiting the citizens of Alba, who wait with mouths of flowers to honor the respiration of sleeping animals, marking roses and roads past extravagant marches accompanied by a flumbling ballet. The night scribes word for word. The night writes the night, more beautifully in the night of those that are gone. In it, a blue dress sings, and underneath the dress is a green heart with echoes of latitudes tattooed over a real heart, over the heart tattoo. A cheap amulet is lifted like gold, nimbly to lips, then starts a voice echoing into melting eyes. The music emits ingenious colors, imploring llamas and armadillos, the goats also. The song is not an invocation, only names forgotten. It travels distances dissipating just south of here, the here no one has heard of because this all but doesn't exist. The last piece has really nothing to do with disappearing cities, uh, but it is about people disappearing in houses. A student asked once if you could do a derive at home. Uh, probably not, I answered, unless you're on drugs. But really, dealing with a dysfunctional family every day might actually be a derive. This is called The Girl Who Grew Up in the Six-Pointed House for Monica Nowens. There was a girl who grew up in a six-pointed house. This is how she described it before she disappeared. Her father said square rooms make square children. And in fact, the girl with her mother and four brothers each grew spikes atop their heads. With these, they would debate the validity of rational roofs until there was so much discord that the father could only see his family as four-sided. As a result, the father left the six-pointed house in his native Holland for a traditional Belgian home with its singular albite predictable triangular roof of a structure of independent discord. Meanwhile, her brothers left for schools of architecture to attempt to modify what they regarded as their father's eccentricities. Instead, they developed obsessions with bulbous masses and blurs resulting in blob and blur-headed children with similarly shaped issues. The girl was left in an abandoned six-pointed house with her mother, who wondered why the calming lines of her kitchen and antiseptic bathroom, perfectly made beds and carefully alphabetized linens could no longer comfort her. Compensating for the absence of her brothers, the girls developed horns resembling a mohawk to shield her mother from the solitude she considered loneliness. She missed the howling voices that would often get stuck in the tips of the pronged roofs. Mother. You must stop resisting someone who's no longer here, for if you don't, there will be nothing left of the house except for you, and I am in danger of becoming a porcupine. Already the girl had taken her mother's inattentions to heart and stopped growing, containing her emotions at the risk they would become too large for her body, while her mother kept expanding. One day, objects in the household, from tea soaps to major appliances, developed not points but downward recessed scars concave pyramids that threatened to bore holes into the earth. 
The floor started to sink and invert, the boards sucking them into the pits. The mother herself, it appeared, was turning into a right angle, and the girl, she kept sliding bit by bit into the orderly lines of her mother from which each of the siblings had sprung. But the girl had become so prickly from trying to win attention that as the house buckled, though she tried not to, she pierced her mother's heart. For a second, the mother had a flash of recollection of a daughter as the two became ungraspable and now forgotten moments at a perfect 180 degrees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judith. Um, my name is Benjamin Bratton, and um, I've taught here since, as you're at SciArc, since the summer of uh, summer of 2001, um, which brings us up. I, I want to, before I get it, I will tell you a little bit. Speed in Politics is uh, a book originally written by Paul Virilio, uh, originally published by Galilei in 1977 in, in Paris, uh, and republished, or in, published first in translation in English by Semiotext Text in 1984. Um, and this year, um, they've republished the book, uh, uh, for which I've written uh, introduction. Uh, it's a book with which I've had um, a kind of long uh, relationship in a way. Uh, as, a, um, as a freshman in college, uh, it was a book that I uh, sort of found accidentally um, and was one of those books like I, I think everyone may have uh, discovered at that sort of time in their life where it uh, seems to sort of change your view um, of, of the world. Really, uh, and uh, and this was a book like this was a book like this for me. Um, at, at the time, then I had also um, uh, founded uh, what was it that what was then uh, the first real uh, there was the first sort of major web-based journal of technology and media theory, uh, which we called Speed, basically in honor of of the book and as a way of trying to make sense of. Let's say make sense of the world around us in the early 90s, the emergence of digital media, the rest of it, and the ways in which this was changing culture, society, economy at some fundamental levels. Um, the third issue of this we had that we, we actually did on Virilio as a special issue where we did, had interviews with him um, and, and the rest of it. So all of this is really a long way of saying that the opportunity um, that uh, Hetty from Semiotext, uh, who's here with us, and Silver Lochinger, the longtime editor of Semiotext, when they asked me to do the introduction, um, I, I see it in a long ways as an opportunity to sort of return a gift. So with that, let me, you know, I have to also, as opposed to reading my own work, I mean, Virilio is a theorist, so he's writing about other people's work, and I'm writing about him writing about other people's work. So, and now I'm writing, telling you about what I've written about um, him writing about. So in these chains of connection. Um, let me begin with a quote um, from, from the LA Times a few, uh, a few months after I began teaching here on uh, September 11th, 2001. The morning edition of the LA Times um, had a, a line in it that I um, wrote down that said, if there had never been a war, I would have made a very good architect. This was quoted, the Ahmed Shah Massoud, uh, the Afghan opposition leader who was uh, assassinated two days before uh, by suicide bombers who were is assumed trained by Osama bin Laden on behalf of the Taliban. Uh, and in a way, um, uh, this is also Virilio's story. If there had never been a war, I would have been, made a very good architect. Paul Virilio's modernity is logistical. It doesn't directly deal with war, but with everything that makes war possible. Logistics is the preparation for war through the transfer of the nation's potential to its armed forces in time of peace as in times of war. Modernity is a world in motion expressed in translations of strategic space into logistical time and back again. It is a history of cities, partitions, trading circuits, satellites, and software of a political landscape governed by competing technologies of surveillance, mobilization, fortification, and their inter interdependent administrations. It begins as an archaeology of naval routes, strategic techniques, and urban distributions, and becomes 
an integrated world of events reduced to shapes and symbols viewed and manipulated instantaneously on screens. In Virilio's narrative, architectural regimes become computational and vice versa. Both are logistical media for mobilization and its administration, technologies that consolidate territory into logistical fields and enable a modern governance based on the abstracted calculation over omnidirectional spaces and surfaces, from open oceans to shared spreadsheets. This comprehensive technologization of the globe signals for Virilia both integration and disintegration, both control and accident. And is finally through the accident, the realization of the imminent irreducible risk that logistics hopes to contain, and not through control, that the strongest bonds of the polis are in fact formed. For Virilio, they are an exceptional condition, already contained within and rigorously, and rigorously predicated by the inventions that made them ever possible. In the 1960s, Virilio collaborated with architect Claude Parent to develop a program for an oblique architecture using inclined planes. It followed the principle of what he called habitable circulation, intending to radically expand the usable surface of the urban landscape. His work as a theorist from the mid-1970s to today can be seen as a, a kind of retroactive thesis on the possibility of such an architecture and ultimately abandon of it in the face of other emerging spatial media. The focus of my research, Virilio noted, has shifted from topology to dromology, that is, the study and analysis of the increased speed of transport and communications on the development of land use. The image of the polis city as a dynamic vehicular landscape is both Virilio's initial architectural solution and his eventual theoretical warning. Dromology from the Greek uh, dromos, or race, race course, is the government of differential mobility, of harnessing and mobilizing, incarcerating and accelerating things and people. This, his third book, is a history of what he calls an inevitable technological vitalism, through which multiple projectiles, the inert membranes of fortress and bunkers, the metabolic bodies of soldiers, and transport bodies of naval vessels mutually prostheticize each other in a pursuit of the competitive advantage of speed. Among the key metabolic transformations traced in this book is the movement from the urban fortress to the open, smooth glacius of the sea, now a vast logistical camp in which, it, in which naval and finally amphibious strategies organize a right to the sea. This, in turn, framed a right to the road and later diagrammed the land in the smooth image of maritime drift. In that shift, the condition of habitable circulation and its origins in military logistics, mobilization, and fortification remains of critical importance. That is, what was once asked of architecture is now accomplished by other means, both informational and computational. Now the presence and vehicular movement of people and objects through global space is tightly integrated in, in an infrastructure of software. And to send objects in motion or to impede their trajectory is a logistical labor performed by pulses of light as much as flesh and steel. I want to read one more section on the accident. In the years since the publication of Speed in Politics, there's developed a rich discourse around the political function of the exception and for the architecture of the camp as a space of that exception. For Giorgio Agamben, the camp represents an extra legal territory derived from its exceptional status as being both founded outside the normal juridical procedures of the state and precisely through this exceptional character embodying the state's sovereignty not only over its over laws, but over law itself and the authority that it realizes. The logic of the camp exceeds the normative productive link of power and resistance, revealing the exception as the real nexus of sovereign authority. Slavoj Žižek writes in discussing Bakhtin that, quote, what most deeply holds us together is a community 
is, is, as a community is not so much identification with the law that regulates the community's normal everyday rhythms, but rather transgression of the law, of the law's exception, that is, the accident. Virilio's own theories of democracy and of the modernity of accidents should be considered in relation to this discourse. He writes that, quote, the precious lesson of the camp and the gulags has not been heeded because it was er erroneously presented not only as an ideological phenomenon, but, it, but also as a static one, as an enclosure. Its absolute inhumanity, the social bestiary of the immense biomass the proletariat subsumed under logistical demands. In the camp, the administration of bare life, of the metabolic vehicles of a dramatic modernity is rendered in stark relief. There is also a softer repetition of this in the world's special economic zones, those extra legal logistical archipelagos that weave the flows of global commerce and mobilize a new normative order in their image. But again for Virilio, the lesson is not the pretentious self-image of hyper-efficiency that such networks communicate, but rather the exception that remains, with, that remains within that exception itself, the accident. The accident within the accident emerges from the identification with the exception that Zizek names. So perhaps in ways that Virilio himself might not recognize, terrorism, uh, terrorism, for example, as well as the state of emergency of counterterrorism is neither entirely complicit with the symmetry of resistance to the law, nor ever possibly entirely outside of it, but instead makes its claims over the sovereign exception to the law's authority to, in fact, ever author at all. This is also the crux of the wonderment and awe provoked by the event of catastrophic failure. It is not only horrific, it is also mesmerizing. And because it is, the accident is also a critical source of solidarity, a binding exception that is the real condition of acceptance. The carnival of accidents is revealed as technology's own exceptional bacchanalia, staged at our expense and on our behalf. Thank you. Hi, I'm glad there's a microphone because I have laryngitis or something like it, I don't know. Frog. Uh, <clears throat> it's funny because this book is about my being sick years ago, but the, this is just a cold from endlessly being involved in uh, schmoozing too much, you know. I schmooze too much, I think. Um, and uh, for any, I don't want to summarize this quickly. Uh, for, for, well, for, uh, my name is Norman Klein. That's I should indicate that in case anyone doesn't know, but they probably. And uh, um, I, I write books in two directions, I guess, in media projects. One direction deals with um, erasure and collective forgetting, particularly in urban settings. And another body of work deals with the imp uh, a kind of history of media as um, controlled anarchy or uh, the architecture of illusionistic or scripted spaces. Those are two directions, and I decided that I should try to blend them into one book as a, as a warm-up. This is a warm-up for a, a project I'm doing now. It's a kind of giant <coughs> science fiction media novel on how the 20th century was imagined before it happened. And the book I wrote, that came out a few years ago called, called The Vatican to Vegas, I dealt with the history of special effects environments from 1580 to the present and promised that while they were mostly about the, the political effects of themed environments, I would do something more gothic, something more interior. So this is part of that promise. I decided I would write a, start with Freud's visit to Coney Island one day in 1909. No one quite knows what happened, except he really couldn't stand American food and hated America and claimed he liked Coney Island, but I don't think he liked anything about it. And, and um, no one knows quite what happened except me now. 
<clears throat> I'm not so much convinced as I've decided to be convinced. And I'll read from that. It seems the most logical way to do it. It's difficult to summarize a book that has fiction and um, cultural criticism and is dealing with the, shall we say, impact of a horizontal culture, a culture where we don't need an unconscious anymore, only good medication. If you notice, most of the HMO plans give you three days, you know, to get better. And then you meet people whose life has fallen apart, you know. They've lost all their money. They've lost all, all the goodness in their life. And you ask them how they're going to handle it. And they just stare at you blankly and they said, I'm fine, you know. And you know that they are. <clears throat> so I, I imagine Freud facing this, this dilemma in 1909. Let's see how I do. If I just bleh, become too much, then we'll just stop. This is what we'll do. <sighs> the facts are simple enough. In September 1909, a relatively unknown Freud spent a week in New York en route to a lecture series upstate at Clark University. The air ranged from muggy to stifling. The museum exhibition on antiquities, the one he had high hopes for, proved substandard. The crowds on the streets smelled of industrial fluids and sweat. Even friendly faces made him squirm. The conductor on a tram tried to be empathetic. He ordered the crowd to make room for the old man. But Freud did not see himself as old, not yet. He pulled back his shoulders and glared, then felt idiotic. Back in the hotel, his stomach was churning from American food. His mouth tasted like rancid milk. His neck felt numb. I'm truly a mass of symptoms, he told himself. I'm a neurasthenic woman. I'll wake up paralyzed on my left side. I need a day by the sea. He rummaged through his trunk for a lighter suit. In the morning before the sewer vapors hit the sidewalks once again, he took a ferry to Coney Island. This is 1909, so say it again. Of course, increasingly, as we know now, he kept these anxieties his own case study in separate leather notebooks, a psychiatric form of double bookkeeping. As the boat chugged along, smoke from Manhattan evaporated into blue mist. Finally, the ferry anchored at Dreamland Pier, what someone called Old Iron Pier. A friendly gust of sea air greeted him, but the view made him wince, like architectural gastritis. A lunatic tower dominated, built like a hodgepodge, vaguely Moorish on the top, wedding cake Venetian in the middle, a wigwam at the bottom. Clustered around it were buildings so tentative, so flimsy, they could have been built with eggshells. They were sketches in pasteboard. Then, toward the horizon, he saw streets that looked like the day after Mardi Gras, like a gigantic drunken operetta. Luckily, it was still early in the morning, even the mist had not burned off yet. The main streets, Surf Avenue and the Bowery, looked sleepy. But then the turmoil began. Within an hour, they were already jammed with confusion. Armies seemed to be scattering in retreat. Freud tried to hide on the beach, but after a few hours decided to enter the irresponsible gaiety. That's a quote directly that I may, I think I made it up, I'm not sure. No, I think it's from him. He started taking notes in one of those leather journals that would remain hidden, even from many friends and admirers for 90 years. At the entrance to Luna Park, he noticed two monkeys on a chain, mother and child. The mother was baring her teeth and hissing while a crowd poked at her little boy, some with umbrellas, canes, some with their index fingers. The monkey child's movements utterly reminded him of children he had treated, a monkey Little Hans, that's one of his patients. If this were an infant, a shock this fierce would undoubtedly lead to phobic behavior. What if monkey stored this shock in an early mental place, a primal sod? And what if this atavistic place survived while the species evolved like gills or tailbones inside the fetus? It would lie hidden below more intricate formations, and yet it would still operate as a mechanism, perhaps fainter in humans than monkeys, or even more convoluted, like folds in the brain. Surely there would be no therapeutic way to find a psychic spot so ancient. 
The monkey child under attack stared agonistically, almost Christ-like. Freud tried to interpret its sublunar gaze, but its eyes were deep onyx. He managed to capture this thought in only a single sentence beneath complaints about the boiled sausage he had just eaten. There's reason to believe that Freud walked into dreamland, the last and most bourgeois of the three amusement parks in Coney Island. To enter, one had to pass through creation, a music hall version of Genesis. Creation began at the mouth of a huge tunnel featuring the massive thighs and vagina of a plaster nude 30 feet high. Her breasts were larger than haystacks. She sparked at least two sentences, a phrase from one survives in the recently uncovered Freud ephemera. Or do Americans prefer genitalia large enough to crush a man or at least ruin his hat? As many scholars have noted since the Freud ephemera turned up in London in 1999, Biblical fantasy was highly eroticized in Coney Island, or turned into a freak show with little boys as Mephistopheles selling bags of peanuts and dwarves with their own freak town. We are also reasonably certain that Freud went to hell. Not only the Hellgate and Dreamland, but also darkness and dawn with hell as darkness in Luna Park. He enjoyed watching the Chicago fire with women jumping from flaming windows. This is all. This all happened, by the way. I mean, to somebody. Nearby, he claimed his hair was nearly singed when the riverboat Prairie Bell burst into flames along the Mississippi. He even yawned his way through Stygian chambers to the River Styx and saw the flood at the crack of dawn. Hellgate at Dreamland caught his attention most of all, particularly its shoddy construction and miserable ventilation. The fires of the damned were made of crepe paper, the walls of hell were paper mache. A reasonable flood from God could have dissolved it all in five minutes. But the mood in hell had a strangeness and irresponsible gaiety. That's also a direct quote, more or less. That Freud assumed was an American problem. Americans like cheerful torture, he decided. Fairy tale rape, Jung would probably call it. Jung would have had a field day with all this. Jung was on to the trip, by the way, he was there. Americans, not that day though, Americans will take a long trolley eye just to pretend to be burned alive. And it's the roller coaster. They think being molested by circus freaks is the most uncanny thing of all. A pretty red haired girl caught Freud's eye as she wandered into Hell's Gate. A girl of 20, she adjusted her new bonnet, posed cheerfully in a mirror. Suddenly, demons in cheap tights grabbed her. With a look of supreme boredom, they lifted her by her armpits. The more she kicked and cursed, the harder they laughed. Then they dumped her like a dead cat down a long trough. Her taffeta undergarment rustled while she skidded out of sight. Afterward, the demons turned and cackled mindlessly to the crowd. An exhausted, obviously gin-soaked Satan snickered his approval. The stale laughter was supposed to be infectious. Meanwhile, the young lady's screams faded away in like manner, her sliding body seemed to hit bottom. Freud heard a faint thud. Then two minutes later, she came storming back. Angrily, she planted her hat, a tuk or tuck, back on her head. Then she gestured rudely, quote, in a masculine way. At the demons and Satan, puffing up, she looked ready to slap someone, but then inexplicably did not. Instead, she broke into a smile. After all, Freud wrote, she had just paid 10 cents to be there. Within 20 minutes, 11 more well-dressed women were thrown down one hole or another with barely a peep from any of them, like Dover souls being dressed and boned. But that was not the only indignity women had to suffer with a smile. At the Lunar Park next door, many well-appointed ladies, even ladies of a certain age, were shoved on top of a small hole where a large gust of air blew their dress above their thigh. Then everyone was supposed to whoop it up Thank goodness my wife and daughter are back in Vienna, Freud noted. Imagine them disappearing like shit down a hole with their thighs exposed. A newspaper he found called this a nightmare world that claims to be bizarre and fantastic. I don't know if I should go on. Am I at my 10 minutes yet? Just about, huh? What? Um, I'll go a little bit longer, I guess, but 
Anyway, he continues um, in German, Freud detailed a sermon given at Hellgate. It goes on and on. I guess if it's almost time, I should, I should stop. But, uh, and, and then eventually he gets a, uh, a translator and a, he begins to have strange hallucinations with the translator because uh, what happened with Freud sometimes with his patients is he began to flash other faces on their face after staring at them continuously. This was a problem of his, and uh, I just made that up, but it sounds right. <laughs> and and uh, why not? I mean, if you stare at someone, you know, 10 hours a week, and um, then she has a brother who, who has a kind of mental condition that's very strange, and uh, the symptoms come back, and Freud then begins uh, the crisis of what to do about mass culture, uh, inventing a topology that in some strange echoed his, his own work. And of course he was convinced it wasn't true, but he kept all his notes secretly buried in a set of documents. The documents grew along with other documents. He never put them in any of his uh, lectures and books. Then in 1920s, he put, had these documents put in, in wooden boxes about that size. And then when he died, he left them with a friend and then they disappeared, as far as we know. And then in 1999, there was a, a, an auction and uh, something called the Travel Diaries of an Austrian Physician was put on sale. And uh, now we know that we have the ephemera Freud and we know almost precisely what he didn't want to tell us about things like this. And the translations are well underway. I, I expect they're coming out. Very, uh, next year or something like that. Wouldn't that be nice if that were true? But it, what? Yeah, it's good. So, so the, the, the idea is to take this line between fiction and fact and, and overlap it to sort of deal with this strange blur that is the reality of our world today that we actually, in a sense, have left, uh, when I, I, I see an, an editor there I talked about, it. we've sort of left the enlightenment notion of objective and non-objective, and we enter the world of whatever is convincing. And it, it's, it's a strange kingdom, but I, th I try to use Freud and others in this book to talk about it. And I th that would be about my 10 minutes, I think. Is that true? Yes. Anyway, so, so thank you. And, uh, yeah. <laughs>